Welcome to the library. <laughs> okay, are we good to go? So good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Alden Library. I'm Scott Seaman, Dean of Libraries, and welcome to this edition of Authors at Alden. Robert Geip lives in Harlan, Kentucky, and grew up in Kingsport, Tennessee. He received his undergraduate degree from Wake Forest University in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and his master's in American Studies at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. He was the Marketing and Educational Services Director for the Apple Shop in Whitesburg, Kentucky. Did I pronounce that right? <laughs> Thank you for that clarification. Uh, an organization using multiple venues and media to document the life, culture, and concerns of people living in Appalachia and rural America. Presently, he serves as the director of the Appalachian Program at Southeast Kentucky Community and Technical College in Cumberland, Kentucky. Additionally, he is a faculty coordinator of the Crawdad Student Art Series. Robert is also one of the producers of Higher Ground, a series of community musical dramas based on oral histories and grounded in discussion of local issues. Trampoline, his first novel, published by the Ohio University Press, won the 2015 Weatherford Award for Fiction. One judge called Trampoline an important book for Appalachia, for teachers, for writers, for anyone who cares about the region and the problems facing its youth. His fiction has also appeared in Appalachian Heritage, Still, Motif, and Pine Mountain, Sand and Gravel. Rachel Terman, our interviewer, is an assistant professor of sociology at Ohio University, as well as an affiliate faculty member of the Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies Program. She specializes in the sociology of Appalachia and the rural United States. Before moving to Ohio, she worked with the Pennsylvania Women's Agricultural Network and is a co-author of The Rise of Women Farmers in Sustainable Agriculture, forthcoming from the University of Iowa Press. Please join me in welcoming our speaker and our interview. I think so. I'll turn on. All right. Uh, so hello, Robert Geip. Thank you so much for being here today, and welcome to Athens and You're our welcome. library here. Um, it's a real summer treat for me, and I'm sure everyone here, to see you in Athens in uh, July. And the last time that I saw you was on Skype um, in my classroom just across the way here, and you were in Harlan just finishing eating lunch, I, th I believe. That's right. <laughs> um, and my sociology of Appal Appalachia class was interviewing you about your book, Trampoline. And so um, I kind of want to start there today talking about the relationship between art and social issues. And I know that you, um, you know, you kind of combine those two things in Trampoline. It's a, a, a work of art, a work of fiction um, that you, where you talk about some so social issues within the story. Um, but um, you are also involved in some other artistic endeavors that, um, that in, that uh, in integrate art and community issues, and I wonder if you can talk a little bit about how you got involved in community engagement in the first place and, and some of those social issues. Okay. Um, I mean, I, uh, I grew up, I was always very interested in um, uh, uh, recluses and artists that retreated from society. Um, I was especially interested in that. Got in that for in grad school and um, uh, studied uh, Emily Dickinson and Joseph Cornell, and I was very interested in outsider artists, artists who kind of position themselves away from everybody, thinking that might be a, a trade I'd be interested in pursuing. <laughs> uh, and uh, um, but then uh, even in in uh, master's thesis, I got interested in the idea of of how people outside of whatever was considered the mainstream 
um, talk back to it and, and how that, that most artists who kind of um, frame themselves as outsiders were actually deeply in dialogue with the, the rest of society as outsiders. And so then, um, uh, then when I came to Apple Shop, which is a documentary art center, and, uh, and actually as I was trying to explain it today, that it just seemed like since the 60s it's been a place where people who lived in the coal fields or wanted to live in the coal fields of Appalachia and, and do what I, I kind of like the term cultural production, you know, that is a, an encompassing term for music and story and film and television and making of things, that, um, that you could be there and that it was grounded in the twin poles of traditional culture and celebrating what had been good and is good about traditional culture in the region and look at social justice and environmental issues. And the thing that kind of, <clears throat> they helped me think about at App Shop was the idea that these were entwined. You know, the idea that, that looking at what was noble about our grandparents and great grandparents' way of life um, was a vital part of a healthy way of approaching the future, whatever the future held, whatever technologies emerged, and that that the best things came from looking both forwards and backwards and, and being critical but being uh, heart-driven. And so that was where I really um, started to develop a lot more consciousness of how important it still was for people who are, are commenting culturally to be able to kind of stand a bit apart from the fray for justice and uh, and to where you could comment on that too, you know, on the on the fight, but then also to be clear about you know what you thought was important and right and wrong and and pursue justice even as you maintain a position where you could comment on it. And I guess that kind of led. That was how I got really fascinated by the um the type of person that that uh, ended up being the narrator of that book mm -hmm. over there, piled up on that table. <laughs> that, that, <laughs> to be precise, yes. <laughs> yeah. And so, um, uh, you, you are also involved in the production of Higher Ground, um, and that's something that integrates these different artistic mediums and some of the um, issues that community members are uh, want to talk about and are thinking about. Um, can you maybe tell us a little bit about that too? And um, if you think it's a particularly effective way of talking about those issues in a community? Um, so higher ground that she's that Rachel mentioned is a, um, a theater project that we started in our community. And I was never really very much interested in theater. I had been um, forced to play the woodsman in Snow White in an <laughs> operetta when I was in the sixth grade and uh, had to sing a solo called I'm a Terrible Man <laughs> in front of my community, and particularly my peers. And, I was not much interested in ever being a part of anything like that again. It's either an audience member or a participant. And, uh, and so I was a kind of a hard sell, um, but we, um, 2001, as some of y'all remember, the, um, it was the beginning of the time when um, Oxycontin and other prescription painkillers were starting to be a national news story that was linked to Appalachia and other places, but you know, that it was... Um, it, it was reality in our community, it wasn't just a story, and it was a real change in the nature of substance abuse in our community. And um, we got involved with the, Rockef the John D. Rockefeller Foundation and wrote a, um, a grant to them. At that time they had a program that I thought was a really good program that they don't have anymore, and it was called the Partnerships Affirming Community Transformation, or PACT, and what they did was they supported communities who would use the arts to, to address a challenging issue within their community. And so we had picked prescription drug abuse and had done a community process to identify some different art forms. And so we did a big community photography project and 
it's weird now. It was like we distributed 600 disposable cameras. This was before people had smartphones, and and so it was interesting. To, it, I'd like to think about it some more sometime because this idea that you know you there were a limited number of images you could produce, and you had to select was was a an idea that been kind of abandoned, right? We all can just produce as many images as we want and distribute them more broadly than we ever distributed anything we ever did back then. But anyway, so we did a photography project and a public art project, and, and then we did this story collecting and theater project, um, all with the idea that it wasn't just going to be talking about the problem, but also celebrating our strength and just trying to do something that would resonate with people and that would be fun and cheerful enough that they would come out and engage with the with the material and um we ended up doing an oxycontin musical and working <laughs> with professional theater artists to help us we had 80 people in it and they were all just kind of non-theater people uh telling stories both about our history and about what was going on and um, Joe Carson, who's a playwright that uh, also has done some work with Ohio University Press, um, was our collaborating playwright. And um, we had a lot of people who were dealing with substance abuse in the play, both as you know, parents or friends or siblings of people who were having problems, people with problems themselves, and just, you know, all of us were having problems with it. It was just a, it was a dangerous and painful it's a, it is a dangerous and painful thing, drug addiction. And, um, and you know, and we were just telling funny stories and telling sad stories and telling stories to make us re help us reflect together on things. And people just kept coming more and more to the play. It's like p the people brought people from a rehab to our plays. You know, we'd have 20 or 30 people who were actually in treatment come. And politicians started coming when everybody else started coming. And originally we had done... You know, one of the reasons we were doing an arts-based approach is we thought we could build community around some of these issues without bothering the politicians, without having to engage <laughs> with the power structure. We thought we could build a coalition of people and a response without, because we didn't think they would notice, right? We didn't really want them to notice. We wanted just to get together and deal with the problem. And so, but it did start, it became a, a the politicians, they, they're, they come where people are. If there are a lot of people there, they like to be seen, with, particularly if they're laughing. They like to be there when the people are happy and uh, suck their happiness from them or something. I don't know. Uh, they, uh, but anyway, so it became this kind of community phenomenon. And I can remember um, standing there and listening to them do a part of the play that I had written and you know, it was it was helping people think about what was going on in the community, and it was like, well, writing isn't such a self-indulgence that you can do it in a way that has a um, public purpose. And so that's when I started. That summer is when I started going to the Appalachian Writers Week at the Hyman Settlement School, and. Here we are. All right, and so <laughs> and now this <laughs> a perfect transition. <laughs> perfect transition to my next set of questions to focus on um, your book Trampoline. And people say don't judge a book by its cover, but I always do. And um, this one is a good one to judge by its cover because I think the cover is very compelling, and then the content inside does not disappoint either. So. Um, for people who in the audience who maybe haven't read the book yet, can you just tell us a little bit about, you know, <coughs> in a very brief <laughs> summary, kind of a little bit about the book? Um, the narrator is a young woman who's remembering a story that happened when she was 15. And uh, she's lost her father in the coal mines to an injury, an accident, a deadly injury. And, um, and her mother's in grief over that and has sought solace in drugs and alcohol and her grandmother is uh, an environmental activist among other things who lives in the community and uh, where she grew up is threatened by a, a strip mine a mountaintop removal mine and so she's involved with uh, some people in the community to try and slow that down or mediate that mitigate that in some way and so i, I was interested 
a lot of my students at the community college were dealing with the, the former issue, the issue of having a parent or a guardian who was having trouble with substance abuse, and where they, they found themselves, um, uh, they found themselves more mature than their parent for a, very, for a variety of reasons. And so they were having to navigate that. And then I was also very interested in uh, uh, the children of activists. You know, that if you're, particularly when they're all in on it and your parents or guardian in this case is trying to save the world and, you know, you're 15 and just trying to not eat lunch alone or whatever, that how do you, how do you, di you know, where do you get your raisin? Where do you get your attention? And so, um, you know, I went to a fiction workshop and they said, what, the way I was taught to think about plot was, well, you have a character that people care about, you got to figure that out first, and then you stick them up in a tree so they can't get down and then they have a challenge, right? And so that's your plot is to get them out of the tree. But then really good plots, it's like you set the tree on fire, too. So not only do they have to get out of the tree, but the tree's on fire. And so uh, either having this grandmother would, you know, you can line it up the way you want. So grandmother was the tree and the mother was the fire, and that was, so that was the plot. And then there's other problems with the tree. <laughs> uh, she's got a number of outlaws in her family, and... Uh, most of her friends are overly aggressive, and anyway, mayhem ensues. And <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so as you were just saying, some of Don's voice comes from some of the young women you were working with at the time, or through the through some of the projects you've done, um, and maybe looking at uh, some of that intergenerational activists and their kids, and and how they kind of you know, take on the issues in their own way. Um, are there any other places that Don's voice comes from? Are you in Don's voice too, or your background, or are there other things that went into creating her character? I, I was kind of interested as we got into doing this work, and you know, it's like, um, we would take students every year, the Appalachian Regional Commission, which is a federal agency, started this program called the Appalachian Teaching Project. and. Um, we would, there were 13 schools in it uh, from around the region, and uh, we would all study a community and think about what to do to help it in, enjoy sustainable economic development. And then we, each school would, and those students would go and present their work in Washington, D.C., and we've done that uh, for 16 years now. And so every December I was taking my students, and then then they were engaged with, did you present at that? Were you, yeah, it's like, so Appalachian State had their um, graduate students in Appalachian Studies there, and, you know, there were lots of students who were very uh, activists, or, my, you know, my students referred to them as the hippie kids or whatever, and so watching them care, you know, but without all this, apparatus for talking about it you know watching them have all the same concerns but none of the summer camps or bumper stickers or you know any of the stuff that went with being a liberal activist and navigating between that and their coal miner parents who were you know pretty much voting Republican if they were voting and just trying to figure out all the stuff they were picking up locally about the problems with people on welfare and you know just like watching them come to consciousness through all that you know it's like that was a lot of I related to that because I didn't I grew up in a conservative community and didn't have a lot of uh, liberal role models in my life even though you know and so it was isolated in that way growing up being pretty sure that I was a liberal is from a from <laughs> my la you know that I um uh so anyway so that whole her whole kind of position as both in it and not in it you know and trying to find her own way of thinking about it it was a little bit out of you know mm -hmm. my experience um so the back, so this is kind of a coming of age story. Or, um, I think it's meant to be that way. <laughs> yeah. uh, 
And the backdrop of it, like you say, is there's this um, mountaintop removal coal mining that's happening in the community, and so that's part of the story. And Don's trying to, you know, figure that out. Um, and I know that you were involved in one of the early fights against mountaintop removal in Kentucky. Can you talk a little bit about that and how it inspired the book? Um. So, the the story in the book it's called Blue Bear Mountain in the book. It. Um, um, is based on the the episode of trying to protect Black Mountain, which was the highest peak in Kentucky. But I, I remember it was right after I'd come to the community college. Uh, some of the local Kentuckians for the Commonwealth member had talked to Roy Silver, who's a colleague of mine at the college, and said that that there was a strip job up Clover Fork. They had a Clover Fork that was uh, so so much explosives were going off that it was knocking some people's houses off their foundation, right? That they were, that this was, I mean, you know, this was everyday occurrence, right? It's, I mean, it literally is an everyday occurrence in the coal fields that, that blasting around strip jobs just damages people's homes that are well off the permit, right? It's, uh, and so, and so they had gone out you know, we had gone out and looked at it, and this is what KFTC did then is, you know, you would, if you had a complaint against a coal company, this is one of the few people you could count on or organizations you could count on to take your part in it. And so we went out, and that's kind of where I learned what a community-based campaign was like. Uh, I had been around some when I was in Whitesburg, but I hadn't really been involved in it. But anyway, so then we're looking at my maps, and we're looking, and it was one of the first um, times I had ever been around a mine where they were talking about mountaintop removal. It was, I think it was probably the first time I ever heard the term. And so uh, we got to looking around about what to do, and it turns out that there's a, uh, I mean, all this is in the book, and it, that there's a, within the federal uh, protection, the law that protects people against strip mining around their houses, there's a thing called lands unsuitable for mining. And certain lands that are special, uh, don't, uh, aren't, they don't just get to be strip mined even if you own the mineral rights on them. And so we made the, and so one of the key things that keeps a place from getting strip mined under the lands unsuitable for mining rule is that it has a federally endangered species on it. And so Black Mountain uh, had Indiana bats on it, which is a federally endangered species. And so, um, I mean, you know, this is the way it goes, or it did go. It's like, I mean, we all love the Indiana bat. I don't think you'd find anybody that doesn't love the Indiana <laughs> bat. Even people from Ohio love the Indiana <laughs> bat. And, uh, uh, but you know, we had tried to protect. We were trying to protect somebody's house. We were trying to protect the community's water, and um, and that just becomes one of the tools. And. The other thing that was going on is that was where the highest peak in Kentucky was, and that meant a lot to some people. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so anyway, so that, and a lot of high school kids got involved in that campaign, or not a lot, a few got involved, and some elementary school kids got involved. And so that's when, you know, so that episode, it always struck me was a, you know, it was a story worth telling, mm -hmm. and so. And like you say, um, uh, Dawn's character, she's kind of caught up in the middle, right? And she doesn't, you know, I think um, the mountaintop removal issue gets discussed in this two-sided way. There's the environmentalist, hippie, tree hugger people against the coal industry, and, you know, it's one or the other, which side are you on type of thing. Um, but Dawn doesn't f fit neatly into either of those categories completely. Um, and you say that's some of you was in that. Can you talk a little bit more about why you decided to kind of leave leave her in that space in the book, or how you decided to orient her? I I think it's more realistic, and I think it's more dramatic. I mean, you know, I think that complicated motives are more interesting dramatically and literarily than simple motives are. Right? I think that very few of us uh, have simple decisions. I mean, there are simple decisions, but you know, most of the decisions that we have to make or we have to balance several different decision-making factors and um, 
And I think that that's something, I mean, and that's very easily dramatized uh, around environmental issues for people who live in coal mining areas, you know, that, um, uh, that, you know, nobody, I don't think, there are very few people who are just pro-destruction, right? I mean, even people who destroy for a living, most, if you gave them a choice between destroying something and not destroying something, they get paid the same and have the same outcome, they, I think most people would say, I'd rather not destroy things. And, you know, that that base, you know, that's, it's like that gets forgotten, right? That it's like people act like people enjoy doing this. And that just seems, it seems obvious, but it's it, our, our willingness to demonize people. I think that um, there are people who manipulate uh, people by appealing to their worst selves and, and their fear and then, you know, and then be help them to behave poorly by appealing to their fear or other insecurities. And, uh, but most people, given a f an even choice, are not going to choose that. And I think that that's, um, in our country right now, that's, that's really good work for fiction writers to undertake, is to help people understand each other um, so that was, I forgot, is that anywhere near the answer to the question? Yeah. <laughs> I love that answer. <laughs> I really love that answer. Um, and I particularly love that part of the book. Um, so this next question I have for you, I have to preface it by saying that I think it would be great if we lived in a society where this question was super boring and that I wouldn't even ask it because it's a boring question, but, um, I'm curious as to why you chose a young woman to be the protagonist, and um, in particular, sh you know, she's uh, she's 15 years old, and she's not, you know, conventionally feminine, really, um, but she has a, you know, she has a, a distinct kind of female voice too. How did you think about developing that, and you know, can you just comment on that? Um. I think one thing was that, I mean, and I'm not pandering, I hope, I probably am pandering, but I thought that was the most interesting character in the mix, you know, that that the the young women I would see at our school were just a, a fascinating mix of toughness and vulnerability, you know, that they were, and that just trying to navigate you know, going back to this idea of navigating, um, looking back and looking forward, trying to figure out what was good from the past and what's good in the future. It's like, I, you know, one of the most hamstringing things for people regardless of gender identity is these rigid gender roles, right? I mean, I think that a lot of people are coming to understand that, that it, in in the same way that, that, um, I mean, I, I, I can, I remember the first time I heard Martin Luther King Jr.'s speech about how, you know, civil rights would be as much of a benefit to white people as it is to black people because it, that we all need to be free of both being oppressor and oppressing. And I think the same is true um, around gender, right? It's that these kind of um, rigid definitions of what, uh, gender is ha, are have been crippling, and um, that you know just watching. I mean, one of the things in our community is is that because coal mining work had been so male dominant, and then that work had been dominant in the economy, men didn't evolve a lot of different ways to be in the coal field, and so then women became primary breadwinners in a lot of families, but they still had this old role that had to do with the fact that men hadn't necessarily found a new role. And so, um, you know, I just, and that's, I mean, 70% of the students at our community college were women, and so that was, so I was hearing a lot of those stories. They were the ones stepping up to kind of, uh, they were getting how important it was to tell stories. A lot of them were becoming addicts, you know, and just out of 
different reasons and had been traumatized in lots of different ways and so um, I think the thing was I never like wanted to pass myself off as that person as this person but this was a person I had heard many times mm -hmm. and knew how the story went you know just from and so the whole I, I mean the other thing I was interested in is that uh I'm just taking this, I'm taking in, t taking the story also fits, but you know, taking in the story that somebody is telling me. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I mean, I was writing for those students. They were my, they were the audience I didn't want to let down the most. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That if it resonated for them, uh, that, I mean, you know, I just, I just wanted to have something that was realistic enough that, that they could enjoy it, but not, be as realistic as their lives, <laughs> you know, that, that there, there was a hopeful story, mm -hmm. or at least, you know, kind of hopeful. Mm -hmm. And so uh, you say you were writing, keeping in mind your students um, as potential readers, um, and, but you also created a fictional county um, for the book, Kennard County, and uh, did, so, were you thinking that you wanted to make it sort of a generic county in eastern Kentucky, or were you thinking that you wanted to protect some of the identities of people that maybe were inspiring some of the characters, or did you think about how the community might react to your book after it was published? Well, I'd written a bunch of stuff that was basically describing Cumberland, but I put it in downtown Harlan, so it didn't make any sense <laughs> if it was real. And so then I uh, just had to, and then I had some other things that happened in Whitesburg in it, and I didn't, you know, mm -hmm. if I made it real, then I'd have to throw out some of that stuff, and I'm yeah. too old to make up new <laughs> stuff. I had to use that stuff. And so uh, it was, it, literally it was kind of, and also I just, uh, I liked that, uh, I just, I had thought of this name Canard a long time ago, which of course is uh, the French word for duck, right? Mm -hmm. And it's also... Um, kind of a joke or a trick or a, a lie, and I just thought that'd be a great name for <laughs> Eastern Kentucky County. <laughs> and it also, I had this big vision that Canard was some uh, lame French general that's in the American <laughs> Revolution that they somehow came to name the county at. You know, I had there's this historical novel back there somewhere <laughs> about C C Lieutenant Colonel Canard <laughs> that did something. So yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I also thought it was hilarious joke. I mean, Don gets all pissed off that uh, the their school Nick, that they're the Canard County Eagles when they're yeah. <laughs> they should be the Ducks or whatever. <laughs> that she just you know I thought that was hilarious too. Um, so have you had have you gotten any feedback from uh, your community on the book? Uh, I mean, my favorite story about that is I had a work study student and she's kind of. She's um, she uh, she's a Don. She was one of the people. It took me so long to finish it, and I'd have these different students come through, and so this one would be Don for a while, and that one would be Don for a while, to where she just became her own woman. But um, she came in there one day, and I the first six chapters had been serialized on a website, and so she came in there and said, uh, "When are you gonna do another chapter?" And I said, what are you talking about? Because I hadn't told anybody I was doing this right. I, in fact, I was didn't think anybody would ever read it, and I'd be dead if they did, right? I, I would just be gone, and they'd find it. <laughs> and, uh, and so this was, you know, and she was like, "Where's what happens next? And uh, that was so, you know, and she, her mom OD'd and died, and, you know, this story was very important to her. And I mean, some of y'all have heard the story before, but she's the one that, uh, in the book, uh, Dawn dyes her hair green, and she's blackheaded. And I, so I asked Lauren, I said, how do you dye your hair green if you're blackheaded? And she said, well, I'll go home and do it. Because her hair had been 50 million colors already. And so she, uh, so she went home and dyed her hair green, came back in the next day, and I came in there and told me, lined it out for me, right? And so... Uh, <laughs> You got to bleach it. Uh, the, so that whole scene in there where Dawn gets her hair dyed green comes straight out of her testimony. 
Um, and so that was important. That was that was important. You know that then. Uh, um, so yeah. So they and you know people. They don't like things. They don't say too much around. They just don't look at you anymore. And uh, but I so you know people like it. I guess. I don't ask them very much at home. I just kind of, people come up and say they read it, and it's good. One of my students got a, a picture from it tattooed on her arm. That was also a big, that was a big moment. <laughs> so that, that was a commitment. So um, to, the, to the work. Um, but so, you know, so that's good. Um, okay, so I have a few more questions more about um, the process of writing, similar to what you were kind of just talking about and some of the research that you did for the book. Um, like you mentioned, you spent many years working on this book. Um, can you go back to kind of the early days and, and um, how the project kind of was started and then developed? Um. So it started with the, the plays and seeing work on writing on stage. And then I started going to the Appalachian Writers Workshop in Hyman, Kentucky, which is a good community for writers, right, really writers anywhere writing about the region or not. But um, most of the people there have some connection to the Appalachian region. And um, a lot of, made a lot of friends who were writers, some of whom didn't have books and now do, and that's a really fun part of that experience, you know, when your your people that you came up through the ranks with get, get their publishing careers going. And then just a lot of, of good writers who um, wanted other people to be good writers and for their work to be read, and so, that community built, and, and then in 2009 or 10, I uh, went to a workshop. It was a poetry workshop with Darnell Arnold, who teaches at Lincoln Memorial University. And she's just a brilliant writing teacher, probably the best writing teacher I've ever been around. And she was doing a thing um, where she would, if you wanted to write a novel and had mo some money to spend, she, she did this thing called the Extended Novel Workshop and you would go and spend a weekend with her, and there were like 20 of us in a cohort, and uh, or 15 of us in a cohort, and you'd, you'd pay her price for a weekend, and then every three months you'd go uh, back for another weekend, and she'd give you assignments in between. And so over 18 months, I went there six times, and that was how you would get the first draft of your novel. That was her process. And y'all have heard this, some of y'all heard the story 10 times, but she, uh, I assumed that as soon as I got my first draft done that its brilliance would be inevitable and she would take <laughs> me to her agent and I would go to New York and uh, that would be that, right? Because uh, she's a great teacher and, you know, that was all, I just, uh, just was putty, clay in her hand. So I got the first draft done. And the trip to New York did not come off. She was like, you got a little more work to do. And so I, um, so at that point, I started doing the drawings and putting them in little chat books. I'm like, well, I'm just going to ha have fun with this because obviously it's never going to come to anything, and I've just squandered a lot of money. And So I started... Uh, I started publishing it a chapter at a time and making my own little zines because, you know, I was a little punk rock boy and we, that's what you do. And I started selling them at Hyman and I sold them at Hyman at the Appalachian Writers Workshop for $4 a piece and $5 autographed. And so uh, <laughs> I did the first three chapters that way and then uh, they got, um, some friends of mine were doing a literary website and they said, well, we want to start serializing it. Can you keep up if we put a chapter up every month? And I thought I could. So then they started posting them online and the first six chapters got published online that way. And then, um, and then the press saw it, Ohio University Press saw it online there and contacted me about it. And that's how we got together. Um, and so you bring up one of the unique aspects of this book, the illustrations in it, and it's kind of a hybrid regular novel and graphic novel, sort of. 
Um, can you talk a little, so the illustrations weren't at the beginning of the process, they came in later. Can you talk a little bit about how that developed? Yeah, I, um, what they kind of, I mean, the, the bottom line is, is that I, I thought they were worth including because they kind of underline this idea that someone else is speaking, you know, and I, I always love comics and cartoons and stuff, and uh, I always liked the way you could kind of, like, you know, I was a big Mad Magazine guy back in the day, and uh, I don't know what the equivalent of that is now, but it was that, you know, in a comic, the character can be saying something, and something else is going on in the background, or there's something on the character's t-shirt that kind of subverts the message, you know, or adds an additional message. You know, the comics have this unique ability to kind of have a couple of things going on at once in a really simple space, and that I thought suited her character. And I think she kind of draws, I can't even remember if I've, she can draw or not. I think she can. <laughs> and, um, but it, it also just kind of fit the um, look I was going for. But really it was that thing of um, somebody's looking at you and talking to you. You know, it's really t to re reinforce the first person nature of this narration. I think it was inspired a lot by documentary film. You know, you hear a voice and then you see a person speaking. And uh, so at some weird level, I thought the comics helped reinforce the documentary kind of influence on the book. Mm -hmm. Did When you were drawing um, Dawn, did that influence her character at all, or was her character already fully formed by that point? She was pretty fully formed. One of the, I mean, one of the things, I can't draw the things looking the same twice, which is a problem. I saw a documentary with Charles Schultz, who was kind of my cartoon hero. Mm -hmm. And he could just draw that Charlie Brown head over and over, <laughs> and it was always just perfect. And I, you know, I can't get her to even look like the same person <laughs> twice in a row. And so, but I kind of could. I got it close enough to where you might could recognize her. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, I just was trying to hang on to that, you know, like trying not to make her neck too fat from the last one I drew and stuff like that. And so, um, uh, mm -hmm. and she's really the only ca character that's that's really drawn out, and her grandma, I think, her face is kind of shown in there too. Was that intentional, or you just didn't want to create too many <laughs> people it to draw? It is intentional. <laughs> I couldn't draw anybody else. I, I, I got one person I could kind of make resemble <laughs> themselves. At the, yeah, you'll notice your grandma appears early, and then she never appears again. I'm like, <laughs> I finally figured out I'm not going back and drawing a bunch of people. It's, uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so. Uh, I also wanted to ask a little bit about um, your thought process in depicting Appalachia and the region, and there's this kind of, you know, history of stereotypical depictions of Appalachia and writing in all, in all kinds of medium, I guess. Um, and I wonder if you, you know, had conversations about that maybe at Hyman or with other writers writing about Appalachia. Was that on your mind, or were you kind of fully confident in going forward and and portraying the region in a, you know, I think it's portrayed very, you know, realistically um, in, in, a, in a not romanticized and not, you know, um, stereotypical way either. Right. Um, I mean, you know, I think the thing was, I just was like, I'm going to write it to where my friends and my students, and I mean, my students are my friends, but those people that I see every day and that are depicted and you know I, I just I just wanted them to enjoy the book I didn't want them to feel like it was representing them one way or the other but I wanted it to be a story about them and I wanted them to enjoy reading it or feel sad reading it I wanted them to have a connection and an emotional response to it and I don't I didn't care about anything else I mean I tried really to stay focused on that and like let the chips fall where they may with that other stuff the only time, um, the only punch I ever pulled that I can think of is Dawn has bad teeth. And I never said anything about that. Because I never heard anybody mention anybody's teeth in the community. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, it doesn't matter how jacked up your teeth are, nobody says anything to you about it. You know, it's just like, what do you think, I need to be told I don't have any teeth? It's like, why would I say that to you, <laughs> right? It's so... Um, so anyway, so there are things like that, you know, it's like, I, I, that was kind of the litmus. If, 
if I wouldn't hear a student say it to another student, I wasn't going to say it in the book. Mm -hmm. And and there's that kind of baseline. Res even though people are just giving people hell all the time, there there are still there are still rules. I mean, uh, there are still things that you don't. I think that was one of the things that's fascinated me about the culture that's way more complicated than than any most things you see is that how people uh, get mad at each other and fight with each other, but when you know you're going to be around people forever and you want to be around them forever, as, as sorry as they are that you you hold back something. You know, you don't you don't just tear each other to pieces every day. <laughs> you wear each other down day by day. <laughs> 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 Over like, the long term. Like the cat that ate the grindstone. <laughs> um, so when can we expect the movie version of Trampoline to hit theaters? Well, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I, uh, that's not my apartment. <laughs> okay. But uh, nothing's in the offing. Well, I know that it's you... It's available. Let me put that <laughs> okay. right. The film rights are still currently available. I think it would make a good movie. I do, too. Uh, but I do know that you are working on a, a follow-up book. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, it's a sequel. It's five years later. Everything's worse. Uh, I don't know who's read what, so I don't want to give anything away that's going on now. But Dawn does survive this book, and she comes <laughs> back. Um, uh, it's got two narrators, I think, and um, it will be illustrated, planning on illustrating it. Mm -hmm. uh, the first chapter of it's coming out in a journal called Southern Cultures that comes from North Carolina somewhere, I think, UNC. Mm -hmm. Is that right? That is right. Uh -huh. and, um, and it'll be out, I think, in the fall. So you can kind of see how it starts anyway. And is it uh, tentatively titled Weed Eater? Is it's called Weed Eater, yeah. Can you talk about that, the titles, why you chose trampoline? And uh, There's oh. a you know, scene with the trampoline in the book, but... Yeah, I, not to give too much away, but I, I always wanted to write a novel where the trampoline was a murder weapon, and so that's what's <laughs> going on. That was how that got started. Um, and um, But in that class with Darnell, we had to imagine our entire career, and, and so, uh, and I just wanted to have three novels and then an HBO show, and, and <laughs> then a big red car. And... Uh, <laughs> Um, but anyway, so the three novels that I uh, named that I was going to write were going to be Trampoline, Weed Eater, and Pop. And so then I tried, so that's it. And I'm just like, why not, why not make Darnell happy? You know, she was a great <laughs> teacher, is a great teacher, so I'm trying to cleave to that. Thanks. Well, I think those are all my questions. I don't know, are, are we taking questions from the audience? So let me just repeat the question so we have the microphone. So uh, Kelly's asking, um, Dawn starts out in the book kind of, she doesn't seem like she's real confident. She doesn't have a lot of things that she thinks she's good at. Um, you know, she's a little bit of a misfit, I guess, sort of. But then she, there's this scene where she um, m makes this kind of speech at a meeting and she discovers she has this uh, capacity to, to be a good orator. And can you talk about that? Well, I think um, the whole issue of private talent and public talent is uh, is something that that happens a lot with um, people who, um, for whatever reason, don't feel good about themselves or their talents, or are scared to step out and and you know make their talents public. And of course, Don throughout the novel uh, has a great talent for yelling at people, 
and uh, which is basically, it's nice to call it oratory, but yeah, she, you know, she basically gets <laughs> mad enough that she forgets she's in public and, and, and defends her grandmother. I mean, you know, that's her impetus, which is the kind of thing that would, would um, bring a person, would cause a person to take the uh, bushel basket off of their light. You know, she, uh, um, she was doing it for her, not for herself, and so that's, that was basically how that was thought through. And then she's kind of like, what have I done? Other questions? Yep. Yeah, I, <laughs> I had many of the same questions that Rachel had uh, that I was interested in learning your answers to, but she asked them already. Um, uh, accidentally, about a week and a half ago, I saw October Sky again, the film. Mm -hmm. And when Rachel characterized trampoline as a female coming of age story in Appalachia, I was thinking back about that film, seeing it again. And listening to you speak, I realized that the dialect coach for that film was spot on uh, because, uh, you know, your dialect uh, <laughs> as, uh, as an Appalachian uh, was certainly the one that Jake Gyllenhaal and, and other characters had in that film. But also the gender uh, issue that come up in that film and, and come up in your novel. Have, have you ever thought of, of doing um, a novel in which both a, a male and female character mm -hmm. would deal with the local community's gender expectation? Um, yeah, in the second novel, there's a, a guy narrator. The, who, he's a weed eater. He's a guy that mows the yard and is in love with Dawn's aunt and so he he gets a little narrative and it's been interesting I've been thinking about it because he's kind of the um, kind of a marginal guy and and you know and he's a guy that mows the yard and is in love with one of his clients and you know it's the whole issue around you know predatory men and um, uh, I just saw uh, I saw that it's on downtown if, if any of y'all seen that movie, Swiss Army Man, that's on right now, Am well, amazing movie about point of view and helping, you know, leading you to identify with a character, and then at the end, you're like, and so, uh, anyway, so yeah, definitely thinking about it. Thinking it's a lot harder. I, I kind of remember, I haven't read the second novel, but I really like that novel, um, uh, Push that turned into the movie Precious, and then uh, about a uh, young woman that had been raped and was illiterate in her kind of journey to identity. But she was having a baby, and uh, uh, Sapphire wrote the novel. And she, the second novel was this first-person narration from the point of view of the baby grown up. And the baby just grows up to be a psychopath, you know, that the that this trauma and tragedy that had given birth to the baby, she just played it out. You know, this baby, did, it was not a happy ending, which was really brave as a novel, but I, everybody, <laughs> every review I've read hated that novel, and I need to kind of read it, because, you know, this this whole issue of uh, sympathetic characters is kind of interesting, you know, that, that we were talking about it today, that it was a pretty conscious decision to kind of have a young woman who was heroic and kind of stood up to her challenges and found a way through them was is a good place to start when you're trying to establish yourself. But you know, it's, it's interesting. I mean, Weed Eater's not a bad guy. He's, he's, I think he's a pretty good guy. But I was very interested in that because it's a it's a thing that happened. You know, we've gotten uh, there's so much going on. There's so many ways to feel about people and just kind of looking at things from different ways. Is, it's it's interesting, you know. It's like how do you maintain people's sympathy and identification? It's hard. Yeah. 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 You said you expected like the trip to New York and everything and all that, and then afterwards you were just kind of kind of having fun with it. Did that affect the way you wrote it, or were you always planning on writing it the way that you did? I mean, I think you wanna you wanna have your cake and eat it too you know you want it to be authentic and resonate with the people in the community 
but you'd like to think that everybody would read it, right? You know, like you'd like to think that it would be helpful in um, people other places understanding part of what it's like where I am. You know what I mean? But at the end of the day, I think that it did become. I mean, I think the freeing thing was. Um, you know, I started doing the little indie things of my own and just like do the thing that made me the happiest. For me, it was like every all the good things flowed out of that. You know, that when I when I had it to where I just enjoyed it way more and I wasn't trying to figure out what anybody else wanted, it was like suddenly other people were more interested in it, which may not be true of everybody. <laughs> Some people's uh, own instincts aren't as, always as good as they could be. <laughs> but anyway, I think that for your own happiness, you got to do that, though. You know, you got to make the book you want to see in the world or the whatever you want to see in the world. Any more questions? Yeah, I mean, the um, I always felt like the thing with Black Mountain was significant, you know, that, that it was a, a real story. And then the other thing was that um, I thought it was important to kind of catch uh, how many things you have to deal with at once in life. You know, so many things in books one crazy thing happens and you have to you know it's like i've heard a writing class teachers say well you know a, a story comes about when on the day that something different happened you know what i mean that it's not the same old day but the thing is it's like most of the students i know they're dealing with like five calamities at once and um and all of them are bookworthy calamities you know this like uh, my child just cut his fingers off and my grandmother just shot my grandfather you know that there's just two or three things that would have destroyed me for about five years if they'd have happened, and they're dealing with three or four of them at once. And so just to kind of catch how strong you have to be to come out functional from all that was really, I'm like, well, that deserves, you know, that deserves uh, capturing and presenting in a way that people can take in. One. I was going to ask you, what was the communal reaction in your hometown after? That's funny. And my hometown is Kingsport, which is like not where I'm at now, but it's kind of connected. And um, uh, my mother, uh, she sold the crap out of that book at home to like all her Presbyterian bridge club, <laughs> junior league friends. And it was like, just, you know, just don't even look at the bad words. Just read over <laughs> the bad words. And then, uh, then where I live now, it's been pretty good. I mean, you know, like a lot, of, a lot of young people have told me they liked it, which is a thing. And then within my Appalachian Studies community, there's a lot of teachers have used it. And so um, I did a couple book clubs in Harlan. That was interesting. Uh, um, but, you know, I've, it, I'll tell you what's funny is some people said, just don't worry about your hometown because nobody in your hometown will ever read it. It's like, that is not true. That was, <laughs> that was not the case in my case. It's like tons. They sold it in a drugstore. One of my friends is a pharmacist. <laughs> and it's like, oh, my God. It, you know, people come up, they're like, I read your book, and then you're afraid of what's going to come next. But it's, it's been all right. I think, I don't know. It's been okay. Thanks for asking. <laughs> <laughs> well, please join me in thanking Robert Guype and Rachel Turner. Just a couple of quick things. We do still have some refreshments, so please partake. We also have, while they last, free T-shirts advertising your library, your library, so please take one. Um, also, on September 27th, Authors at Alden will present political analyst and Ohio alum Kyle Kondike, who will talk about his book, The Bellwether, Why Ohio Picks the President. 
And our interviewer will be Ohio professor Tom Suits from the Scripps School of Communication. So thank you. Will this be available online now, or is it just a one-shot deal? No, there is an Authors at Alden website where we archive all the video from okay. these. Okay. Usually takes two or three days for them to come up. Um, but you're more than welcome to log in at any point. So thanks, everyone.